the sense of evil in the Lord of the Rings is palpable and it is part of what makes it compelling. It is the sense of, of the lurking menace that is growing and threatens to overcome all of Middle Earth. The shadow in the East is spreading and it's spreading. It's been very, very slow and then it moves very, very fast. Sort of like people describe uh, a crash. Things happen, they seem to be in slow motion until you hit and then suddenly it's, it's not slow motion anymore. I was in a car accident two years ago and you're in, I mean, we, I flipped my car three times, ended upside down. When, you, when you're in the midst of it, it's, it seems like slow. And, uh, and then you hit and it's bang, They're really hard. Um, and in Tolkien's, the way he's depicted time, we already talked about this last time in relation to Gandalf when he finds the ring, that the ring is, this is not just any old ring, this is a, an important ring, it's a ring of power, he has to go away, and how long does he go for? I don't know, 14 years, maybe longer. He's away for years in the archives trying to figure it out. And so the time lapse there is the slowness which he spares us from, more or less. But he's been away a long time trying to figure out. And then when he comes back and he, he gives us this sense, and Tolkien's very good at demonstrating this to the reader, at least to the reader's sensibilities, there's a sense that Gandalf has run out of time. He doesn't have enough time to stop what has been initiated. And the enemy's hand is far outstretched. His plans are well advanced. He's too late. He's been, he's been uh, he says something to the effect of that he has been uh, how many years he's been there since the dawn of time and now he's run out of time. He doesn't, and he's, remember when he rides off in the, the two towers and he leaves them in Helm's Deep and so they'll be back in five days? He's got no time. So look for me on the fifth day, right? But uh, he, the, the sense of we have to go as fast as we possibly can to stop or, or thwart a plan that has been long advanced. So that sense which he conveys all over the place, the same thing with the battles uh, that carry on. It's like, it's too late. And there's a sense of doom that has, so that's part of the, the ethos of the whole novel that makes it novel, the trilogy that makes it compelling. It's not just there, it is growing to the point where it can't be stopped. So with that then, what are his options in terms of portraying evil? Well, there are two in general, uh, two views. Uh, I mean, there's more than two views of evil, but historically speaking, you can either fall into the view of evil that Augustine himself read at first. One is of the religious thinker, philosopher, Christian heretic, Manny, third century AD, who portrayed two powers in the world, one good, the other evil, fighting it out in a cosmic battle. Does that sound like the Lord of the Rings? It does. And no, moreover, the power of evil is greater. Now that's not Manichae's view, Manny's view, but still that sense that evil is at hand. Now, how does he portray the good then in that sense? He portrays it in terms of uh, the way the Gnostics would see it. So the world is ineradicably evil and it's related to its embodiedness, the fact that it has a physical existence. It's the physical existence which is evil. And the goodness, on the other hand, is related to the nous, the N-O-U-S, the mind, which partakes of the good. So it's a, a lot like, it's, it's a dualistic view, very much in, uh, that will be, find itself fertile seedbed in the minds of, of the Greeks. Because it, it fits with a, a platonic view of the body to some degree. 
<coughs> the ideas, the mind uh, beholds the good, and those are the, the good is an intellectual thing, but it's not a physical be thing. It's not a physical incarnated reality. The physical incarnated thing, the idea of the dualists in the uh, ancient tradition of that of Gnosticism and so forth is that to be embodied is evil. And the body is like a prison house for the soul. The soul is a, uh, it's not the brain. It's not, don't think about the, what we connect with the physical entity. It's the mind or the soul. It's a spiritual thing. So the spirit is good, the body is evil. Everything embodied is evil. Let me give you a various texts that will speak against this from Christian theology at least. I've already done this here. Uh, we'll go with this one. It's good. <coughs> I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, which is your spiritual worship. So the idea that your body is connected to spiritual worship is a con totally con contradicts the dualistic view. So does God taking on a body. <coughs> Jesus, the bodily incarnation of God, the divine human, fully God, fully man, his physical death, his physical resurrection is not just a spiritual, an idea in the minds of his followers. It's very important that Jesus had a physical human body just like us. So our bodies are a temple of the Lord. They're to be used for spiritual praise, etc. So the idea that human nature is an embodied one. So when I said that, Boethius said that to be a person is an individual substance of a rational nature, that doesn't deny the embodiedness of it. It's just, it's, it's a rational type of embodiedness. Whereas angels don't have physical bodies, but they're rational. It's a substance. Anyway, um, but Manichae pushes it into a, a, a idea that evil is a physical thing and good is a mental type of thing. In other words, it fits in very well with Descartes. Not that Descartes thinks the body is evil, but he does think that it is <coughs> he doesn't see the body as part of human nature in the same sense as he does the mind. He has a problem with it, and he can't solve the problem because, he, again, he thinks the body is an extension of thought, right? which is the real us. Our, the real us is the thinking thing, and our bodies are just an extension of our thinking, whether, which means I can change my body and still be me. Just it, it will act in accordance with my will. I want my body to be like this, and therefore it will fit that reality. <coughs> so it's not, per, strictly speaking, evil. Anyway. That's the traditional portrait of evil, which seems to suggest the reality of evil, which we all feel, as you say. And I acknowledge, like in a car accident, I felt the evil <laughs> of being hurt. You get punched in the face, you have a toothache, you feel the evil of the world, or you suffer injustice. That, everyone acknowledges that as a reality. But what we don't acknowledge is the greater reality of good, which we've already enjoyed, and uh, in which we live, move, and have our being. Uh, in part because we're, not, we're uh, f failing to acknowledge the true power of goodness, which is the whole point of the Lord of the Rings. It doesn't appear this way, but it is this way. So that's the Manichaean view. That's the dualistic view. That's where there are two powers, a good one and an evil one. And the evil seems greater. That's not Tolkien's view, I will say. His view is the Augustinian view. It's behind me from Augustine. I'm going to take this from Augustine. This is from his book called The Enchiridion. I don't think I can I have to take this off and I'll put it on the board for you. You can see it's chapter four. Problem of evil. I'll just read from it. All of nature therefore is good since the creator of all nature is supremely good. But nature is not supremely and immutably good as is the creator of it. Thus, the good in created things can be diminished and augmented. For good to be diminished is evil. 
Still, however much it is diminished, something must remain of its original nature as long as it exists at all. For no matter what kind or however insignificant a thing may be, the good which is its nature cannot be destroyed without the thing itself being destroyed. There is good reason, therefore, to praise an uncorrupted thing. And if it were indeed an incorruptible thing, which could not be destroyed, it would doubtless be all the more worthy of praise. When, however, a thing is corrupted, its corruption is an evil because it is, by just so much, a privation of the good. I'll explain that in a sec. Where there is no privation of the good, there is no evil. Where there is evil, there is a corresponding diminution of the good. As long, then, as a thing is being cor corrupted, there is good in it, of which it is being deprived. And in this process, if something of, it being, of its being remains that cannot be further corrupted, this will then be an incorruptible entity, natura incorruptibilis. And to this great good, it will have come through the process of corruption. But even if the corruption is not arrested, it still does not cease having some good of which it cannot be further deprived. If, however, the corruption comes to be total and entire, there is no good left, either because it, it is no longer an entity at all. Wherefore, corruption cannot consume the good without also consuming the thing itself. Every actual entity, entity natura, is therefore good, a greater good, if it cannot be corrupted, a lesser good if it can be. Yet the only foolish and unknowing, yet only the foolish and unknowing can deny that it is still good even when corrupted. Whenever a thing is consumed by corruption, not even the corruption remains, for it is nothing in itself having no subs subsistent being in which to exist. So what's the consequence of this? From it, this it follows that there is nothing to be called evil if there is nothing good. In other words, evil doesn't exist. Contrary to what Manny says, there isn't good and evil to beings, to entities. Evil is just what we call the privation of good, an absence of good. It's the lack of goodness. We perceive it as having a real solid reality which hits us in the face. What we're experiencing is a deprivation of health a deprivation of peace, of tranquility, of whatever. That's what we experience as evil, and it's, it's a hard experience. We acknowledge the reality of it, but it has no reality per se. Health had the reality. Sickness is the deprivation of health, and therefore an evil. It's, a, it's, like a, it's a bit like a cancer. Uh, except cancers are actually cells, but it's a different type of cell. It's a bad illustration. It really is nothing. And so when, when things become more and more evil, that it's not that they grow in evil. That's our, the way we describe it. It's a bad use of language. It loses its goodness. That's what's really going on. So you, define, you don't define things in accordance with evil. You define them in accordance with good. And this is why Christian education will is it, it's absolutely critical that it be focused on God because God alone is good. And so you can't define things in accordance with human ideas of goodness that are going to be corrupted from the beginning because there's not in humanity this there's a problem of evil within human beings. They do evil things, even their ideas are evil. I'm not talking about a person's. I'm talking about everyone's. Because the heart is evil from, the from our mother's wombs. We're evil. It says so in scripture. But Jesus is good. Yes? I guess that, that makes sense as to why in the Lord of the Rings, the, I mean, I haven't read this in the Lord of the Rings. Um, That's okay. What I understand. Works the, the same way. Right, the world itself is good. It is. It's a corrupted good. Yeah. It's a deprived good. And it doesn't present itself initially as evil, even when in the original, so in the Silmarillion, Iluvatar uh, 
sings the world into being. And along comes Melkor, and everyone's singing along with him. Melkor introduces his own little melody. <laughs> and at first, people think, oh, that sounds pretty good. And then they realize the consequence of his song are at odds with the original song. There's discord where there was concord. Everybody's singing from the same hymn sheet at first. And then he introduces a little twist on this. And the twist, it's a good way of putting it actually, I'll come to this in a second, but a, an evil is a twisted good, a perverted good, a good that misses the mark. The word for sin in the New Testament, one of the four, is um, hamartia, to miss the mark. Uh, in the Psalms, it talks about people being like twisted bows. You know, you shoot the target, but it's the bow that's twisted. It's not the aim of the marksman. The bow itself, human nature, is it, it, it's twisted. How twisted? I don't know. Depends, probably. But it's all twisted. If a twisted bow, you can't hit the target. So there's something corrupted in the nature of, of a human being, which is why it's not just, you know, Jesus doesn't just need to, cor to correct a bad idea. He needs to take on human flesh and give us the right, a, a, a human body rightly used, rightly lived. So it's his model there as well. Yes? So Dr. Mark basically is a point of view that you shouldn't, like, make a point of not being created, and that you should be good, but Acknowledge what's already good. Okay. So if you want to go back to our course on Milton, he talks about all good education yeah. is the what? Do you remember the phrase? Oh, <laughs> I, I do know. Oh, okay. We'll say it out loud, John. Do you remember? Repair the ruins of our first parents by knowing, regaining to know God or right. Right? Yeah, I remember that. You do. Yeah. But that's so to repair the ruins. That's what learning is. It's a recovery of what's been lost. Now think about that in terms of Tolkien's view of his own craft or his metier as an academic. It's to get back to the roots of words and, and rediscover their original meanings and purposes. And, and if we do that, we'll be getting digging down to the lost goodness, which has been corrupted by human usage. And so the, again, the idea of returning to the origins uh, makes scholarship a very conservative thing. We're trying to find what was lost. Just like Gandalf, he goes back to the old library and spends years in the archives. Painstaking, slow, um, but that's what education is. Modern education is about developing new things and creating new people, a new society. Tolkien is, we've already seen Lewis's view of modern education. This is the abolition of man. You're creating men without chests. You're making for people who will never be able to withstand propaganda. <laughs> at a time when you want people to fight against your enemies who are trying to destroy us, you want to ask them to call upon virtues which you've denied they actually have. Because those virtues aren't real, you say. It's just a, a feeling that we have or a sentiment. And our feelings are not objective or real. They're not solid. They're not rooted in any reality. So you can see where this starts to become important. So the idea of Evil then is connected with the idea of education again, as well. I'm trying to connect threads for you here. But in the Augustinian view, there is no such thing as evil as an existent thing. It's a, it's a privation of the good. In Greek, we use uh, the alpha in this way, the alpha privativum, it's called. Not an unbeliever, I'm agnostic. What's an agnostic? Doesn't, he claims he can't know. <coughs> because it's impossible to know is why. That's, that's the point of the agnostic. It's impossible to know. Well, that's because they don't deny the reality of the physical world as having goodness. It's only within. I know the goodness within me, but I can't know about any goodness outside of me. 
After all, God is just an extension of my own being, according to Descartes. It's just a bigger form of me and better and you know, omniscient, omnipotent, etc. <clears throat> but it's an extension of my raised cogitans. I can conceive of a being infinitely greater than myself, etc. <clears throat> but the alpha privativum is that this is a way of construing knowledge such that it precludes goodness. Was there a hand? Yes. Yes, yes, Satan has goodness insofar as he exists. Insofar as he exists, he still ha possesses goodness. If he was wholly evil, he wouldn't exist at all. By then, this is Augustine's argument. He would not exist at all because an evil, wholly evil is a non-thing. Would, there would be nothing there. Some think the, the devil doesn't exist because they see it in Manichaean terms. They mustn't see it that way. The devil is explicitly referred to by Jesus as well. Nobody talks more about hell and the devil than Jesus does. The problem for people who want to see Jesus as the nice cuddly guy and then there's Paul the nasty, uh, you know, fellow, um, doesn't really hold up because Jesus is the one who most talks about uh, hell as a reality, sin as a reality, and the devil as his enemy and it's portrayed in the Gospels furthermore. Um, so there is a being, a fallen being, but he is a creature. He's not equal and opposite to God. He's like Melkor in Tolkien's mythology here. He's a being created by Iluvatar. And Iluvatar could choose to remove him altogether. But he doesn't do that. He lets them have their will. And then he mends what has been brought into discord through his own means. And that's outside the canvas of Tolkien's portrait, how he's going to fix everything. Um, because remember, the whole account is prior to scripture, in a sense, chronologically. How mankind is going to be redeemed is not in this story. Neither is God. So that is how evil is portrayed. It is portrayed as the privation of the good. Um, by the way, the word public and private are connected to this. The ancient world placed a huge value on the public life and uh, regarded the private life as lacking in that. <coughs> the private life is domestic life. Domestic life they saw as necessary for life. That's how you come into being, is through the, ha the home, the family. But in the Greco-Roman conception, there's something lacking of the ultimate goodness, which is in the public life, that you don't find in the private life. You're, you're deprived of the good of the public life. I'll get too up, far off track if I go down that rabbit trail. I write about that in my own book. Uh, but, um, and it, so it doesn't have the sense, the modern sense of privacy as a, a realm of intimacy and uh, a sphere that um, God acknowledges. Both of them, uh, uh, the, the household and the family is, at, is under assault from the pagan conception and the modern world. Anyway, that's another topic. But here's the portrait of evil then. It's a privation of the good and goodness, however, is exalted in it. And this is the other thing people notice about the Lord of the Rings, is that the good is so winsomely portrayed that we love the good. <coughs> and if he only portrayed the evil as he did, I think we would not appreciate it nearly as much as we do. I'm going to read you the... No, there it is, Edmund Wilson. Famous review. Is the review here? It's not here. Okay. Famous review of stupid. Let's 
is going to be it. Please actually give me the review. There it is. Called Ooh, Those Awful Orcs, Edmund Wilson. He, 1937, Dr. J.R.R. Tolkien published a children's book called The Hobbit, which had an immense success. The Hobbits are not quite human race who inhabit an imaginary country called the Shire and combine the characteristics of certain English animals. They live in burrows like rabbits and badgers with the traits of English country dwellers, etc. They have elves, trolls, and dwarfs as neighbors, and they are associated with a magician called Gandalf and a slimy water creature called Gollum. Tolkien became interested in this fairy tale country and has gone on from this little story to elaborate a long romance which has appeared under the general title of the Lord of the Rings. And it has been praised widely. You can read this afterwards. I'm not going to read the whole of the things, but I wanted to focus on this. He, including among his many admirers, is um, the figure of W.H. Auden, great poet himself. Admired it greatly. And then comes the sharp criticism. In the meantime, as sometimes happens with works that fall in with one's interests, uh, he loses the, loses the plot, basically. It is indeed the tale of a quest, but to the reviewer, Edmund Wilson, an extremely unrewarding one. The hero has no serious temptations, confrontation rather, in more or less the traditional forms of British melodrama, of the forces of evil with the forces of good, the remote and alien villain with the plucky little homegrown hero. There are streaks of imagination, the ancient tree spirits, the ants with their deep eyes, twiggy beards and rumbly voices, the elves whose nobility and beauty is elusive and not quite human, but even these are rather clumsily handled. Not much development. In the episodes, you get more or less the same thing. He has no he has little skill at narrative and no instinct for literary form, etc. Moreover, on the country in which the hobbits, the elves, and the ants, and the other good people live, the forces of evil are closing in. They have, a band, have to band together to save it. The hero is the hobbit called Frodo has become possessed of a ring that Sauron, the king of the enemy, wants. That learned reptilian suggestion, don't give it, you goose fleshly feeling. In spite of the author's disclaimer, the Sargophil ring does seem to have larger significance. The ring, if one continues to carry it, infers, confers special powers. It's felt to become heavier and heavier and exerts on one a sinister influence that one has to brace oneself to resist. The problem is for Frodo to get rid of it before he can succumb to it. And then he portrays evil. What is this? Well, the bugaboos are not magnetic. They're feeble and rather blank. One does not feel they have any real power. The good people simply say boo to them. There are black riders of whom everyone's terrified, but who never seem to be anything but specters. There are dreadful hovering birds. Think of it, horrible birds of prey. There are ogreish, disgusting orcs who, however, rarely get to the point of committing any overt acts. There is a giant female spider, a dreadful, creepy, crawly spider who lives in a dark cave and eats people. What one misses in all these terrors is any trace of concrete reality. He's making my case for me. The preternatural to be effective should be given some sort of solidity, a real presence, recognizable features like Gulliver or like Goggle, like Poe, not like those phantom horrors of Algernon Blackwood. Tolkien's horrors resemble these in their lack of real conduct with their victims who dispose of them as we do of the horrors of dreams by simply pushing them out or puffing them away. As for Sauron, the ruler of Mordor, doesn't the name have a shuddery sound, who concentrates in his person everything that's threatening the star, the build-up for him goes on through three volumes. He makes his first rather promising appearance as a terrible fire 